Well, I'm always intrigued how people can see the same thing and come to very different conclusions on it. So for instance, Ken Olson, who was the president, chairman, and founder of Digital Equipment Corporation in 1977, wrote, there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. <laughs> Western Union Internal Memo, 1876, this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. 1927, H.M. Warner of Warner Brothers says, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? <laughs> and uh, near and dear to many of you in here, uh, drillers who Edwin Drake tried to enlist into his project to drill for oil in 1859 said to him, drill for oil? You mean drill into the ground and try to find oil? You are crazy. <laughs> or my favorite uh, was the Beatles as they performed in front of Decca recording and the response was, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on its way out. I'd like to just pose the question this morning along those lines, and that is, um, if we're asked a uh, number of uh, men in this room, um, women otherwise and so forth, what movie best reflects the meaning of Christmas? You know, what would be some of the answers that would come up? It's a wonderful life. I mean, you, you gotta put a wonderful life in there. All kinds of others, better, worse, and so forth. But my question is this, if we were to talk to the angels in heaven and were to ask them, what do you guys think is the movie that best reflects what Christmas is all about? I'm absolutely certain they would come back and they would say, hands down, hands down, the movie that best reflects Christmas is Saving Private Ryan. That's not what we'd expect. But I want to suggest that, in fact, if we look at truly the biblical narrative and put it in context, saving Private Ryan, which is the story of the Normandy invasion going in and, 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 and pulling uh, uh, Private Ryan out, it really does come closest to the biblical uh, portrait. What, what, what piqued my interest in this is what C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity. So no, notice he says, enemy occupied territory, that is what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, you might say landed in disguise, and is calling us to take place in a great campaign of sabotage. Now what in the world is he saying there? You have to understand, when he wrote those words, it was right in the middle of World War II. But what he's doing with this statement, every word here is pregnant with World War II imagery. Every word. We're just going to take this step by step, but let me just begin by saying this. The great tragedy of Christmas is not commercialism. The great tragedy of Christmas is emasculation. That somehow in 2000 years, we've managed to reduce the greatest shock and awe campaign that heaven has ever assaulted upon earth. And we've traded it in for eggnog and its stained glass windows and Christmas Eve services, all of which are fine. But I love what John Eldridge says on this. Nothing wrong. The only problem is there's nothing in that that takes your breath away. And if Christianity doesn't take your breath away, something else will. So true. Oswald Chambers says the same thing a little differently. He says this, human nature, if it is healthy, demands excitement. And if it does not find its excitement in the right way, it will in the wrong. I don't know a better way to describe what I think the Bible's about than the words of Sam to Frodo in Lord of the Rings when they're walking through the jungle and Sam turns to Frodo and he says this, I wonder what sort of a tale we've fallen into. Isn't that awesome? The Bible is the tale of tales. It's where we get the information of what God's been doing, what he's continuing to do, what he will do. And the question is, what's our part? And I want to suggest that the tale of tales has six acts. We go all the way back, the starting place, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. We begin with what I like to call exuberant Godhead. We start with the Trinity. Then we move forward to act two, and that is sinister revolt. And on your handout, you'll notice in Revelation 12, seven through nine, 
He says, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels with him. Act two lets us know that we now live in a universe at war. Then we move to act three, and I like to call this unrivaled craftsmanship. And this is Genesis one and two. And we find God moving in as the unrivaled organizer. And he separates the moon from the stars and the darkness from the light, so forth and so on. And then he's the unrivaled creator. And he goes about creating. And when it's all said and done, at the end of Genesis chapter two, you have a perfect creation and you have a perfect creature who's created in the very image of God and life is good. And then we move to act uh, <clears throat> four, which borrowing from Milton, I would simply call paradise lost. And we all know the story. Adam and Eve succumb to the wiles of, of the serpent and they fall. But what we have at the end of uh, Genesis chapter three, two things have fallen. The creature has fallen and the creation has fallen. It's not just the creature. But in Genesis 3.15, God looks at the serpent and says, basically, we're on. And he says, I will put enmity, which means hatred, literally. I will put hatred between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise, or better translation, it shall crush your head and you shall crush his heel. And his point is, there is going to be a truceless warfare between you and me. And you are going to gain a temporary victory you're going to be able to crush the heel of this one. But that victory will be mightily overshadowed because he will crush, not your heel, he will crush your head. And when they took Jesus to the cross, they took him to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. The entirety of the rest of the Bible, Genesis 4 to Revelation 22, is God reclaiming the two things that were lost in the garden. He's reclaiming the creature, Genesis 4 through Revelation chapter 20. He's reclaiming the creation, Revelation 21 and 22, new heavens, new earth. God gets it all back, but at a titanically high price. And that then moves us into, and I just like to call basically act five, unstoppable advance. It's the tsunami of God. He begins by coming to, to Abraham and you'll notice he says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Five times in Genesis, three times to Abraham, once to Isaac, once to Jacob, God comes and says, I'm gonna bless you, but I'm gonna bless you because you are here to be a blessing to all the nations. This is the first giving of the great commission. Genesis chapter 12. Now, the reason I bring this up is that was her calling and it didn't go so well. And as we continue through tracing the history of Israel, we find that Israel becomes increasingly, increasingly self-absorbed. She stops long into it being a blessing to the other nations. Her prayer is simply that God would wipe out the other nations so that she could be on the top, so life could be good once again. But all along, God says, that's not why I put you on this planet. And we find at the end of the story, Revelation 5, 9 and 7, 9, the tsunami of God comes to an end. And we find that there are men and women from every tribe, every tongue, every nation around the throne of God. And their song is, worthy is a lamb for you have redeemed us by your blood. And it's in the middle of this act that we discover, first of all, I would call the landing of the rightful king. Notice, notice again what, what Lewis said. Enemy occupied territory, that is what this world is. The, wor the world presently belongs to Satan. First John chapter five, the whole world lies in the lap of the wicked one. That's why he could offer to Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, but it's only temporary. It's enemy occupied territory, just as France was temporarily occupied by the Germans. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, you might say landed in disguise. And this is where I think we really get into the heart of what Christmas is about. Basically, Christmas is the Normandy invasion. The beaches of Normandy was the entire land of Israel. But Bethlehem, sleepy Bethlehem, 
Bethlehem was Omaha. And notice he says, you might say, landed in disguise. Look at this verse in, in Revelation chapter 12 to understand why this is so significant. Another sign appeared in heaven, a great fiery dragon having seven heads, ten horns, so forth and so on. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child, what? As soon as it was born. As soon as it was born. What does that mean? That means that like the Germans waiting for the Americans and the Allied forces, Satan is on the prowl. He's waiting. If you were Satan, where would you go? It's obvious. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is surely where this Messiah is going to come. He's going to rule the nation. Of course, that's where he's going to come. Who would have thought? Bethlehem. And under the cover of night, the greatest undercover operation in the history of the universe occurs. The king slips in by cover of night. Mission accomplished. If you were living then, what would you expect the Messiah to be like? What would you expect? Everything you knew from the Old Testament, here's the conquering king. But who would have thought, who would have thought that this conquering king would slip in disguised as a full-blooded humanoid? like you and me. Listen to Max Lucado, I love what he says here. The omnipotent in one instant made himself breakable. He who had been spirit became pierceable. He who was larger than the universe became an embryo. And he who sustains the world with a word chose to be dependent upon the nourishment of a young girl. God is a fetus, holiness sleeping in a womb, the creator of life being created. God was given eyebrows, elbows, two kidneys and a spleen. He stretched against the walls and floated in the amniotic fluids of his mother. God had come near. He came not as a flash of light or as an unapproachable conqueror, but as one whose first cries were heard by a peasant girl and a sleepy carpenter. The hands that first held him were unmanicured, calloused, and dirty. No silk, no ivory, no hype, no party, no hoopla. Were it not for the shepherds, there would have been no reception. And were it not for a group of stargazers, there would have been no gifts. Angels watched as Mary changed God's diaper. The universe watched with wonder as the Almighty learned to walk. Children played in the street with him. <laughs> and had the synagogue leader in Nazareth known who was listening to his sermons? Look okay. Jesus may have had pimples. He may have been tone deaf. Perhaps a girl down the street had a crush on him or vice versa. It could be that his knees were bony. One thing's for sure, he was, while completely divine, completely human. For 33 years, he would feel everything you and I have ever felt. He felt weak, he grew weary. He was afraid of failure. He was susceptible to wooing women. He got colds, burped, and had body odor. His feelings got hurt, his feet got tired, his head ached. To think of Jesus in such a light is, well, it seems almost irreverent, doesn't it? It's not something we like to do. It's uncomfortable. It's much easier to keep the humanity out of the incarnation. Clean the manure from the manger. Wipe the sweat out of his eyes. Pretend he never snored or blew his nose or hit his thumb with a hammer. He's easier to stomach that way. There's something about keeping him divine that keeps him distant, packaged, predictable. But don't do it. For heaven's sake, don't. Let him be as human as he intended to be. Let him into the mire and muck of our world. For only if we let him in can he pull us out. And the moment that his feet hit the ground, two special ops forces go into motion. Special Ops Force number one, the Shepherds. Their mission, to announce far and wide that Operation Salvation is a go. Special Ops Force number two was the wise men coming from the east. But like Normandy, there were casualties. Rachel weeping for her children as Herod makes sure that everyone in the Bethlehem region 
every boy two and under is slaughtered. But it's a safe landing and the king is here. Secondly, it's the launching of the king's revolution. Notice uh, again that quote by C.S. Lewis, <clears throat> enemy occupied territory, that's what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, you might say landed in disguise, end of, end of quote. Now he's gonna move on, he's gonna say, and is calling us to take, uh, take part in a great campaign of sabotage. Now what in the world does he have in mind with that? What he has in mind is exactly what was happening in World War II. And you, you, on your other handout, you have a picture. They were called partisans. And these were men and women, boys and girls who had escaped the clutches of Nazism. Mainly they were Jewish. And they banded together. And they went around living in forests, living in barns, living wherever they could get safe. And they all came together with one united purpose, and that was to make life as miserable for the Nazis as possible. So they derailed trains, they blew up bridges. I want to suggest that the image of a partisan is one of the very closest images that we have of what it truly means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. When Jesus then came, first 30 years, we only have one recorded statement of his. And it's at age 12. You remember his parents came looking for him in the synagogue, in the temple rather. And he says, did you not know I must be about my father's business? And the simple point is that even at age 12, at the earliest possible age, he understood that he was a man on mission. He understood, he had laser-like focus that this is why I'm here. Jesus came on mission and he's inviting us to join in it. We'll never obviously do what he did, but we can proclaim what he did and we can reflect what he did. So <clears throat> first thing he does is then um, beginning at age 30, just as in, in the Omaha, you had steep cliffs, you had to be able to overcome those cliffs and the, the enemy fire to be able to start making progress. He had that event in his life. You know what it was? Because if this doesn't go down, nothing else is going forward. And it's what Philip Yancey calls the showdown in the desert. It's his temptation. And the fiercest temptation that hell could possibly hurl, three of them, one after another. And he weathers the storm. And the future ruler of the universe demonstrates that he's the ruler of himself as well, which Adam never did. But now we're ready. Now we're ready to move forward. And for the next year and a half, he goes around blowing up bridges, derailing trains, cutting down telephone wires. That's what the Bible says, <laughs> only a little differently. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? Blindness, paralysis, mute, demon possession, on and on. Literally, he went around as the partisan par excellence the doing good and the power of the Spirit for the glory of God and the blowing up of the bridge is exactly the same thing. And may I just say that you and I are called to the very, very same lifestyle. What does it mean to blow up a bridge? What does it mean to derail a train? Well, he gives some specifics when he brings together a group of fellow partisans that we call today the disciples. And every great revolution has had a central document. Uh, the Com Communist Manifesto for the Communists, Mein Kampf for uh, Nazi Germany. He initially, as he's going around Galilee, he's got his eyes out for men that he considers faithful, available, teachable, teachable that he could make into partisans. He lays out the Kingdom Manifesto. He lays out the central document of this new revolution. We call it today the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 through 7. It was his stump speech. He gave it all over the place. He didn't just give it one time. But basically, <clears throat> what he's doing is he's calling these men, and you'll see this in Matthew 5. He says, you're the salt, not of Israel, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light, not of Israel, but of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And then notice he says in the last verse, let your light, he doesn't say shine, so shine. Every religion teaches let your light shine. Christianity doesn't. 
Christianity teaches, let your shine, light shine in such a way that people are monumentally more impressed with the God behind you than the works themselves. You're here simply to spotlight the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Do it in such a way that people say, man, there must be something different. The entirety of the Sermon on the Mount hemorrhages with the word surprise. If the Roman soldier tells you to go one mile, you do what? You go two. If someone asks you to take away his tunic, takes your tunic, give him the cloak as well. Christianity does not get exciting until it becomes surprising, if you don't remember anything else. Too many of us in this room are bored with our spiritual lives, if we're honest, if we're honest. And the fact of the matter, we're called to be partisans, no less than these men were 2,000 years ago. And so the, cam the campaign uh, is, is, moves forward. He trains these men and then obviously goes to the cross and he dies. But that death will be the foundation for a revolution that never, ever, ever ends. And his parting command, the thing that he wants the most, he says, you partisans, John, James, Peter, I want you to give the rest of your life to something that I did. I want you to invest yourself in men and women who will become fellow partisans with you and they'll turn around and they'll invest their life in others. He didn't say, go ye therefore and preach sermons. He didn't say, go ye therefore and build churches. He didn't say, go ye therefore and sit on boards. He didn't say, go ye therefore and tithe. He only asked for one thing. And if he gets this, he gets everything else. And he doesn't even say, be a disciple. He says what? Make disciples. Make disciples. And that, my friends, is what we are hugely, hugely about. And we're just simply saying, join us. We will have different discipleship courses scattered throughout the city. We have a, a six um, uh, course curriculum that we believe if you'll go through this, you'll have the tools, you'll have the training, and we will give you the opportunity. This is a big, big uh, part of it. We will find you a place of service if you don't already have it. And you know what happens? You get to plunder Satan. It's a blast. Do you know how much fun, I don't know if fun's the right word, but you know how satisfying it is to drive right into the heart of River Oaks and establish an event and you can see people coming that you know have never gone to church, but they're hearing from somebody typically in the working world. A relevant, authentic presentation of the gospel and their faith and they're surprised. We'll teach you how to build up, how to blow up bridges. We'll teach you how to derail the trains. We'll invite you to a quality and a significance of life. I promise, I promise, I promise you can't find anywhere else. I mean, I've tried pretty much it all. And if there's a bigger in game in town, I want to know about it. But you know why there's not? Very simple. Because God created all of us with eternity in our hearts. And then you know what? He rigged life. He freaking rigged life. So nothing else can, 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 can uh, fill it. The only thing that can is the things that last forever. Word of God and souls of men. That's normative Christianity. That's not for the clergy. That's not for church leaders. That's for everybody. We want to help you. Come along. We will help you to be able to go out and be the partisan that you were created to be.